Buenas tardes a todos los presentes. Soy Axel de los Marcas a Franca Velasco, del área de publicidad del director académico 2022 de la carrera de Arquitectura y Urbanismo Ambiental de la Universidad Científica del Sur. El día de hoy estamos reunidos para continuar con la segunda semana internacional de Bioarquitectura, el evento anual de la carrera de Arquitectura y Urbanismo Ambiental, en donde se desarrollan conferencias, encuentros, debates y talleres a lo largo de seis intensas jornadas, con profesionales especialistas de siete países, quienes traen contenido para impulsar aún más el enfoque sostenible de la carrera, transformar su, tu práctica profesional y conocer las mejores prácticas sobre arquitectura, urbanismo, materiales, dibujo, construcción y tecnologías aplicadas que implican positivamente la labor del arquitecto contemporáneo. Para ello, en primer lugar, le cedo la palabra a nuestro decano, el, arqu el arquitecto André Neri Figueiredo, para que nos brinde unas palabras de bienvenida. Arquitecto. Gracias, Excel. Eh, buenas, muy buenas noches ya para todos los presentes. Es eh, un honor estar acá nuevamente en esa segunda semana de eh, internacional de bioarquitectura, nuestro evento anual de la carrera de arquitectura y urbanismo ambiental. Eh, y hoy con la presencia de un um, um, un gran exponente, yo diría uno de los más importantes exponentes eh, en el tema de eh, urbanismo biofílico en el mundo, ¿no? Eh, es también un, un, una, un gran honor poder tener a Tiña acá, le agradezco ya desde eh, ahora su disponibilidad y su presencia para estar aquí. Y este, quisiera también eh, invitar a cada uno de ustedes para que continúen en toda la programación de uh, la Semana de Arquitectura, que eh, esta, en esta ocasión vamos a tener toda la semana con diferentes actividades presenciales y virtuales hasta el día sábado. Sin más, eh, le doy la más cordial bienvenida a ti y bienvenidos todos. Hello. Can, can you hear me? André, thank, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Very good. Very good. I'll, I'll go ahead and start. And um, I, I'm sorry I can't do this in Spanish. So apologies for uh, having having to speak in English tonight. Um, but good, good evening, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and, and share the screen um, and see if I can find my, my presentation. Um, so I, I want to do several things tonight. Um, I've got a slightly different title. Um, but it's uh, basically what I'm going to do is very quickly um, talk about biophilic cities, but just as a way of framing the topic of bird friendly cities. So most of the slides tonight and most of the content is about this idea of a bird friendly city, but I see it very much um, as part of the larger uh, question, a larger challenge of creating biophilic uh, cities. So um, with, without further ado, let me just quickly run through a few uh, slides. So um, as An Andre just said, I think a little bit about the Biophilic Cities work that we've been doing and the Biophilic Cities network that we run. Um, we have a, a global network, um, about 26 uh, cities that are partner cities. We have uh, several hundred organizations and several thousand individual members. Biophiliccities.org is our webpage. We'd love all of you to, to uh, go there and find out more about it. Uh, at the heart of this is this idea of uh, thinking about cities in a different way, as places of nature, not as opposites of nature, uh, but places where we can be, in fact, immersed in nature. So the word biophilia that, that really means this innate uh, affiliation or connection to nature, the idea that we need nature, it's not something optional, it's absolutely essential to leading a happy and healthy and meaningful life. 
And so that's at the heart of it. Um, there's a lot of research, I think most of you know, I'll talk a, maybe a little bit more about birds, the research around birds in just a second. But um, when you think about those things in life that give us uh, delight and, and joy and, and meaning, there are things uh, like the things here, there are uh, trees and flowers and butterflies and water, uh, all things that we know are, are biophilic that reach us at a very deep level. And birds uh, certainly fall into that category. Almost every week, there is some kind of new research uh, further demonstrating the power of nature. This is just a study from uh, bioscience showing uh, that where you have greener neighborhoods, uh, more trees, more greenery, more birds, uh, that you find lower levels of depression, anxiety, and stress reported by the residents in those places. So we know that at the end of a of an experience in nature, a walk in a forest, um, the research shows that that our, 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 we're calmer, uh, our stress hormone levels go down, uh, we get a boost to our immune system. So the evidence is for me pretty compelling. Um, we don't entirely understand what the science of biophilia is or, or what exactly is happening. Part of it has to do, we think, with the shapes and forms of nature, and in particular, the fractal shapes that we see in the natural environment and, and, and that are so easy for us to process. Uh, uh, we've developed a visual system, as, as Richard Taylor uh, says here in this quote, this idea of fractal fluency. Um, and listening to birds, um, the image on the images on the left, a very interesting uh, project where they have been using bird song as a way of gently testing a hearing for hearing loss. So we know though that the research shows that in when we hear bird song, that has that that effect on us, that positive effect. It changes our mood, it calms us. Uh, uh, the cognitive power, our cognitive capabilities increase when we have those kinds of natural sounds. So, so there's so many ways in which uh, having nature around us um, delivers benefits and, and, and um, improves our lives. Some of the things on the left, all the things on the left are connected in some way or another to nature and, and there uh, is evidence in the research. So again, lower depression levels, improved mood, increased physical activity, increased cognitive performance. In the presence of nature, um, all, we see this kind of remarkable power, uh, even evidence that shows that we're more likely to be generous in the presence, presence of nature, more likely to be cooperative. You could make a good argument that we are better, uh, better human beings when we have nature all around us. And so uh, one word that I like a great deal is the, is the word, a word called flourishing, or the word flourishing, because it captures not only the, the pleasure we get from nature, um, the benefits we get from nature, but, but the deeper sort of connections to nature, to the environment, to each other, uh, the deeper meaning and life that we get from having nature uh, around us. And of course, there are many uh, utilitarian reasons for uh, having more nature in cities. And as we try to address climate change and, and, and we're going to have to, to think about how we, how we manage urban environments that are hotter, and that have um, more, more serious weather events and, and floods, for example. These are images from Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Uh, just about anything that you can do to make a city more uh, biophilic or natureful will also make it more uh, resilient. And it's important to kind of recognize the time we're, times we're in coming out of this pandemic. Um, global pandemic has, has uh, led us to recognize that nature is uh, absolutely important. <clears throat> we, we don't want to be without nature. It, it's been a, a solve, a, a balm, a, 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 counter, a, a, a counterpoint to the otherwise uh, discouraging lives that you know, many of us have, have had to, to, to be inside too much and, and have, have had health uh, challenges and, and a very stressful time. But nature, and, and in particular birds, I'm gonna make this point several times, during the pandemic, we've we've seen a remarkable interest in in bird watching and listening to birds, and and uh, and perhaps we've hatched a whole new generation of of bird lovers at at, at the same time. So biophilic design and planning um, is gaining traction around the world, and it's about incorporating nature 
natural daylight, greenery, trees, uh, into buildings and, and building design, bringing nature inside, certainly. Um, we have wonderful examples of biophilic buildings like the Phipps Conservatory in Pittsburgh, one of, another one of our uh, partner cities in our Biophilic Cities Network. This, by the way, is a wonderful case study, uh, the Center for Sustainable Landscapes. You see the green roof on the top and windows that, that open and every, every desk has a view of the surrounding nature. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful example of how we can be designing uh, with nature in mind and nature being at the center of that design. We are, excuse me, by the way, making short documentary films about many of these biophilic design examples or stories. And so there is a short uh, five or seven minute film about the Center for Sustainable Landscapes that you see here uh, on our on our web page, on our biophiliccities.org. So biophilic cities are cities that connect us to nature and connect us to each other. Certainly it's about parks and gardens, but it's about many more things. It's about really seeing the city uh, in a very holistic, ecologically holistic way. It's also about understanding the city as uh, a place where we, we um, make room for many other forms of life. I'm, again, I'm gonna focus on birds uh, in just a minute but the idea of a multi-species city, that we want to live with many other forms of life around us. We want to have cities that are full of biodiversity. And in the times we're in, where we're seeing this remarkable loss of biological diversity around the world, cities can be at least part of the answer. Uh, can, so we've got to think about the, the sort of conservation mission of, uh, of cities. There are also, uh, uh, deeper ethical um, dimensions to this. We believe that there is a, a, a duty to coexist um, and, and recognize that nature is not just something that is useful for humans, uh, that it has inherent worth, intrinsic value, and, uh, and we need to respect it even in, in cities. So um, our vision of biophilic cities for the future, cities, again, that are full of life, multi-species, biodiverse, uh, uh, places where we are immersed in nature. So in, instead of seeing uh, ourselves as separate from nature, we wanna be living in, in cities where we are, where, where nature is all around us. We are a part of nature. We are not separate from nature. Singapore, uh, you see here is one of our partner cities and has, has perhaps sort of advanced this idea uh, more than any other city, uh, calling themselves a garden city, uh, more recently a city in a garden, and even more recently, the idea of a city in nature. And sometimes they talk about a biophilic city in nature. So a city is not just a place that has spots of nature, uh, a park that you walk to and visit. The nature is somewhere you have to visit. We want to be living in the nature. We want to see that city as a natural system, as an ecosystem, which it, which it absolutely is. So the vision is of immersive nature, integrated, continuous, and seamless. It's, it's built environments and natural environments together. Uh, it's biodiversity and wildness. It's parks, in, certainly, but it's thinking beyond parks. It's whole of city, so it's rooftop or, or room to region or bioregion and all of the different scales in between. It's nature that you experience throughout your life in a city. Excuse me. So at a very early age, um, every school should incorporate nature and you should experience that nature throughout your life and, and into adulthood. Um, and, and, and as you age, um, it, it, nature is there all, all, all around you. It is also just and inclusive. We, we are, are seeing a lot of needed attention to social equity and social justice and thinking about a fair distribution of nature in a city. And it's also a, a culture of biophilia. So um, again, a whole of city approach. Here's a, um, a, map of, uh, a map of the green spaces system in Helsinki, where you can move from, a, from the dense center of the city all the way out to old growth forest at the edge of that city. And you have this sort of interconnected, multi-scaled, uh, integrated green green spaces network. Pit Pittsburgh is one of our biophilic cities. Um, these are just some of the ways that this city sees its biophilia, sees its nature and its 
tree canopy, it's, it's connections to the water, uh, it's looking at greening rooftops, um, but it's also again about, about um, seeing their city uh, as a home for many other forms of life, including birds. So gaining traction, Raleigh, North Carolina is our 26th city, the capital of the state of North Carolina, very interesting city for a lot of reasons. I've got a couple of examples, I think, from Raleigh a little bit later. So uh, all these cities are doing wonderful things, setting ambitious targets. Um, this is Richmond, Virginia, the capital of our state, uh, setting in its new comprehensive plan, a pretty ambitious set of targets for tree canopy, for example, the idea that everybody uh, in the city should be within a 10 minute walk of, of, a, of a park. Um, so again, do visit the biophysics.org if you'd like to know more about some of these cities. Um, I, there's a, a, a page uh, about each of the partner cities and a lot more information about what they are doing. So now um, I wanna just transition to talking about this idea of a bird-friendly city. So this is a relatively new book for me um, called The Bird Friendly City, Creating Safe Urban Habitats. It's uh, uh, published by Island Press, uh, reflects a kind of lifelong uh, interest in birds or love of birds that, that I've had. Um, certainly starting at a, at a very young uh, age. And um, you know, I, I see birds as these sort of remarkable uh, living things that we co-occupy uh, spaces with, including cities, they are magical. Um, they're, you know, these are this actually these are two two paintings um, of a local artist here uh, by the name of Cynthia Burke, and um, we have a number of her her paintings. And uh, she she paints animals, not just birds, but uh, she kind of conveys. Um, she, she presents them in unusual ways. And he, here you see the halo and the wings. Um, so this woodpecker is, is uh, an angel <laughs> and uh, a northern cardinal on the, on the right um, in this kind of regal attire. And um, I, I like this because not, not that I want to anthropomorphize birds, but rather, um, I don't think that we see them always in this way. They are noble and they are uh, incredible and they are um, wondrous and they do things that seem to defy the laws of physics and they are, they are magical. And so uh, you don't have to believe in, in um, angels or fairies or, you know, we, we've got birds that are pretty close to angels, uh, not, not because they're intrinsically nice or good to each other. If you've ever watched, for example, uh, hummingbirds, uh, we, we love hummingbirds and they, are, they, they fight fiercely, not always very nice to each other, but they're, they are remarkable creatures. And so uh, we want to see them in cities. We want them around us. So of course we can enjoy them. And, um, and they do so much to animate uh, urban environments. I realize that may be a little bit uh, loud. I'm gonna try to uh, put this down a little uh, bit this again. <laughs> I'll, I'll turn the volume down a little bit. So um, this is a wood thrush um, that you hear. This is one of my favorite birds and I look forward to its return every spring. And I hear that sound and I think of where I grew up. I think of my parents. I think of the times I spent uh, in, in the landscape. Um, and so there's an important sound uh, element to, uh, to birds. Again, they, they so, um, so importantly animate or reanimate our cities. And by the way, the, the species on the right, a white, white-throated sparrow, I heard my first white sp a threaded sparrow call yesterday, or it was this morning actually. And these are birds that nest, it's, they spend um, most of the summer in the boreal forests of, of Canada. And so they're now coming back through mid-Atlantic US. And, uh, and, and so they're like friends to me. Um, and they have this very, this whistling sound, if I can tell it,
anyway, that's my best uh, imitation of a white thread sparrow call. So they're, they're so important to us. And again, um, during, <clears throat> during, the, during COVID, uh, I've had a lot of people um, tell me, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence about the importance of birds. Um, we've had huge, of course, stresses on our mental health, uh, especially younger people. And uh, here's some, some, some evidence uh, from an article published in, in Nature, uh, pr pretty, pretty you know, serious increase in uh, anxiety and depression. So nature is not the only thing, it's not the only antidote, but it's, it's, it's a powerful one. And, um, and this is an article headlining, headline from maybe the New York Times, I'm not sure on the right, but bird therapy taking off as millions of birders, um, you know, uh, try to address the, these, these stresses with, with watching and listening to, to birds. So um, a lot of evidence that we are spending more time doing that. Um, we know the, the traffic to, to bird conservation sites has gone way up during the pandemic. We know there has been a, an increase in the sales of bird feeders and, and binoculars, uh, for example. And so uh, we'll see what happens um, as the pandemic fades away, if it ever does. Uh, whether or not we'll continue to care for for about birds, I hope we I hope we will. And as most of you know, uh, birds are uh, experiencing some some you know terrible pressures right now globally. Um, this is a study actually that came out right before the pandemic, the fall of 2019. It was shocking uh, to us that um, we estimate this is the Cornell. Um, lab of ornithology that did this study, basically looking at uh, the abundance of birds today compared to 1970, not that long ago, and discovering or concluding that we've lost uh, almost 3 billion birds uh, during that, that time, a, a remarkable decline in, in the abundance of, of, of birds. And uh, just, and I will actually read this, but that that's about a 30 percent decline by the way um since 1930 or 1970 rather um just about um a month ago the bird life issued their state of the world's birds for 2022 they do do this every year um it is equally alarming and their conclusion overall is that about half the bird species worldwide are in decline uh, and um, that's certainly true for it's about 40 percent for the U.S. or or North America, but it's uh, and and that's pretty bad. But it's even worse when you when you look uh, globally. Uh, what's going on? It's a combination of things. Of course, we know about deforestation and habitat loss. We know about increasing use of pesticides and herbicides. Um, we know about climate change, of course. And I think a lot of, for a lot of us who love birds, uh, there there is a sense that so many of the things that that um, so many of the the causes, so many of the things that are causing the decline in in, in bird populations are beyond our control. It feels like uh, certainly with things like climate change, it feels like there's not much we can do. Um, but uh, when it comes to thinking about the hazards uh, birds face um, around us where we live and the, thinking about the built environment of cities um, and thinking about what it might mean to make a city bird friendly, there, there are things that we can in fact do. And I think the, if there's a positive part of the story here, it's that there, there are things not, not necessarily um, hugely expensive things, things that we can actually do that will make our cities more uh, bird safe and make our cities more bird friendly. And so we can make a difference. There, there are um, things we can do individually. There are things we can do in, with, in groups. There are things that city governments can do and must do, I believe. And I'm going to talk about, about some of them. So um, if I don't get through all of this, um, that, that's okay. And I'd be uh, uh, ha happy if you looked up this, the Bird Friendly Cities book. Um, I don't know if it's available there. 
but uh, Andrea, we can find some ways to send send down some copies uh, of it. Um, yes, I'm there sure is it's on Amazon. It's a, it's on Amazon. Yeah, yeah. so you, you you can get that. It's um, of course in English, but um, so it's it's um, a, a lot of the list that you see here, and I, I I won't have time to go through all of it, but but it again a lot of it that things that we can do at an at an urban level. Uh, can can make a, a, an immediate difference in in the conservation of of, of birds. So one of the big things, um, one of the first places to start, is with the design of buildings. And we know that uh, that that buildings and cities are are uh, very dangerous for birds, mostly because of windows. Um, this, by the way, these are images from a uh, a wonderful volunteer organization that goes by the acronym FLAP. Um, they kind of a pioneering organization in Toronto. There's a, there's a chapter in the book about Toronto. And um, the founder, a guy named Michael Mizur, um, uh, ba basically the first city where they started to develop an awareness of how birds were, uh, were dying uh, by striking windows, and we we you know we know that we know that birds don't see windows as barriers. They frequently see they see the reflected trees or reflected clouds in a window, and they strike those those windows. Um, and and so making those uh, buildings and windows bird safe has been a, uh, a, a really is a really important thing that we need to, to do. So FLAP, um, again, one of the first um, organizations to help raise awareness about just the numbers of, of birds that are killed each year. There is one estimate that you, you frequently hear from a study uh, that suggests that the number just for the US alone is something like a billion birds a year that are dying from window and building strikes, often during uh, peak migration times, during the spring spring and fall. So one of the things that, that uh, FLAP started to do um, is they've got this network of volunteers and they go out during peak migration times and, and uh, walk around the base of buildings and they collect dead birds and, and also injured birds. They, they, they uh, take those injured birds to, to places where they can be treated, uh, but they collect all, all of the dead birds. And then uh, once a year, they bring those dead birds out and, and display them. Uh, and it's very visually dramatic. The idea, of course, is to, is to, is to, is to show visually just the, the numbers of different birds, the different species that are being killed by striking windows and, and buildings. And there are very few species that are immune to that. Uh, there are some species that are more susceptible to it, but, but it's a powerful thing. And it's, it's uh, at once very sad, uh, but it's also empowering um, because uh, cities like Toronto, Toronto is very, the first city really to put in place mandatory bird safe design standards. So this is um, in the form of a requirement essentially for new buildings to have uh, some form of pattern, usually a fritted pattern that's baked into the glass, but it can also be uh, you know, a, a pattern of dots or, or something. It has to be at least uh, five centimeters by five centimeters in, 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 its, in its pattern density. We know that that's what birds will, will see. Anything that's not as dense, they won't, they won't see. Here's just another example of one of the the the, the uh, displays. Uh, um, it's the Royal Ontario Museum, I think, where they uh, usually set up these displays uh, once a year. So fritted glass um, with patterns baked into the glass is a very very effective answer. And so an example of that in New York is the Jacob Javits Center. This is a convention center that's been completely retrofitted now with fritted glass, and the evidence is pretty compelling. So more than it's been a more than set, more than ninety percent reduction in the mortality of birds, um, and and not only that, um, they're discovering that with fritted glass, with bird friendly glass, you see reductions in energy consumption. 
um, you see, you know, the carbon footprint of buildings go down. So there are these kind of multiple functions that are served um, by bird-friendly uh, design. Um, so the the city of New York actually uh, is now. Um, by the way, here's a here's a green roof that was uh, installed at the same time of the retrofit, and the green roof is a habitat for birds and and um, a very interesting story about green roofs in, in, in New York. This is what fritted glass uh, looks like in a pretty dense um, pattern there. Um, so I forget if I have a slides later, but New York City has now adopted standards that require minimum bird safe uh, design uh, up to the first 75 feet, I think, above, above grade. The lower uh, levels of buildings uh, tend to be the more dangerous places for birds. They're more likely to be bird strikes there, and uh, and so it makes sense to concentrate on on those sort of first five or six floors, if you will. We can also retrofit um, buildings, uh, and we can we can often do it very in a very um, cost effective way without a lot of money or resources. So this is an example in the book. Uh, the Frick Environmental Center in uh, in Pittsburgh, and um, a group of high school kids helped to design and install what are called paracords. These are uh, like parachute cords that 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 drape down from the top uh, ab above the glass, and they they sit on the outside, the exterior of the glass. You can see them here, and and they are they prove to be very effective in terms of alerting. Uh, birds to the glass, to the to the hazards. So, so there's a really big challenge in in how we retrofit the existing buildings that that we have. Um, a a really good example of what we're seeing now in lots of places, which is the the incorporation of bird safe design from the beginning in in many new buildings. This is the Candida building uh, on the campus of Georgia Tech University. Um, in Atlanta, Georgia, and you see the fritted glass on the on the right there. Also, a, a biophilic building uses a lot of wood, um, has a number of really interesting design elements to it. But it was bird safe. Thinking thinking about how the how the the building uh, protects birds wasn't an afterthought. It was something they they started with. By the way, this is um, an example of a certified living building. Under the Living Building Challenge, uh, a green certification uh, program um, around the world, um, and and uh, you have to one of the things you have to you have to show that your building will produce at least as much energy as it consumes. That's so net zero uh, energy. It's also net zero water. Uh, it's a very ambitious uh, set of targets that, that that buildings have to have to adopt. Um, okay. Other examples, this is um, the so-called base camp, the headquarters building for a company called Interface Carpets in Atlanta. And uh, we have a short film about this one on our webpage as well. Really interesting, the most dramatic feature is this, this um, set of panels uh, the, wrapped in this uh, polyester sheath in the shape of a forest, life-sized forest. Um, and it creates interesting dappled light inside the interior. And it, it's, it's certainly a biophilic feature, but it also makes the facade of the building, makes the glass visible to birds. And so it is an, another example of a bird safe design uh, strategy. Uh, one, one pretty famous example also described in the book is uh, Jeannie Gang's uh, design of the Aqua Tower. Jeannie, Jeannie Gang, you're, you're your architecture students will will probably know that name. Um, one of the few practicing architects now with kind of an emphasis on birds or a, a strong interest in birds. And the Aqua Tower, you can sort of see it's a, a, a combination of using a fritted bird safe glass and also these uh, exterior uh, wavy uh, terraces that actually create this um, this ability for birds to see the the facade of the building. Plus, it's just a, a visually very, very 
uh, interesting and distinct uh, building. So Michael Mizur, the founder of FLAP, is, has frequently said that um, making a building bird safe will also make it more interesting from, from a design point of view, from an aesthetic point of view. So an example uh, he likes to cite is the Ryerson University Student Center in Toronto, which has this elaborate, uh, very interesting uh, facade um, with all these funny shapes and re really an, an, an interesting um, building, very different looking building. And it's one that, you know, at once is both bird safe um, you're not getting birds hitting these windows. They, they see this exterior uh, layer um, and, and one that's just vis very visually distinctive. So you can, you can do these things together. Uh, I was doing a, a presentation a few months ago and I had a, uh, a guy ask me, well, what, a, what about um, residential? What about single family homes or, or smaller scale um, buildings? We tend to we tend to emphasize in presentations the high rise or bigger, bigger buildings, and he's absolutely right. Something like forty percent of the of the death, forty uh, percent of the birds that are killed from from window strikes and building strikes are are hitting uh, residential structures. So this is um, a, a kind of um, educational brochure uh, by put out by Flap, uh, but there are now I mean, a lot of material. A lot of off-the-shelf uh, uh, ways of making your uh, the the windows and 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 um, dangerous spaces around your house um, or or your low-rise apartment um, safer for, for for birds. So companies like um, various feather-friendly various companies that that produce. Uh, pattern decals and th things that you can again retrofit your you know your windows with can can be very uh, powerful. Um, lights are an, another big part of the dangers created by cities and the dangers that that birds face as they move through cities, especially during peak migration times when you have you know millions of birds that are flying through and around cities. And most of this migration happens at night. So uh, when they see the lights, they are drawn to those lights. And a lot of evidence that shows that the more windows that are lit up, the more mortality you're going to see. Um, and it's, you know, the, the birds are flying around disoriented. They're, uh, they sometimes, you know, die by hitting, hitting a building, but they often are exhausted and fall to the ground. And they might uh, hit a window late you know, in the morning or some other some other point later. Um, just many, many um, birds that die because of the lighting up our cities. So a lot of cities are now uh, um, engaged in some form of lights out, trying trying to to get uh, uh, building owners to turn off the lights, particularly from about midnight uh, to 6 a.m. in that in that range. This is a, a story about uh, Philadelphia, uh, one of the most recent additions to the Lights Out group. Um, it's a voluntary Lights Out. Um, let's see, I, I guess it's my only slide, but uh, I mentioned the city of Raleigh, North Carolina, and they're kind of interesting because they, they have adopted a policy a municipal policy basically says that all municipal buildings and properties must turn out their lights uh, during peak migration. That's uh, one of the few cities to 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 have a a strong uh, uh, municipal policy like that or a policy directive. And I think that's a really good thing uh, to do as well. Um, so there are a lot of other ways that we need to be thinking about birds in our planning of cities. If you look at any um, randomly chosen plan from a city. These are just three examples from the U.S., San Jose and Los Angeles uh, County in California, and then Denver and Colorado. If you were to look at the table of contents, look at the index, um, you, you'd be hard to, it'd be very hard to find any mention of birds and, uh, or nature more, more broadly, in fact. And so I, I think that, um, we need to be incorporating birds more squarely in our uh, municipal planning, city planning strategies. One exception 
to this is Vancouver. And this is talked a lot about in the book. And, and Vancouver has a standalone bird strategy, um, which is a set of um, recommendations, um, kind of an action plan of things the city wants to do. There is a standing bird committee um, in the city. Uh, so, so that city stands out for having incorporated some of these things in, into their plans and planning system. Another example, good example, is Edmonton, Canada, uh, where they have been uh, emphasizing a lot of, in a lot of their planning uh, ecological connectivity, and uh, and so one thing they have been doing is using uh, this idea of circuitscape uh, modeling, where you kind of basically the idea of circuit theory, like an electrical circuit, looking at pl places in the city where you don't have as much connectivity, maybe. Where, where there is a circuit break, basically. And so if you're looking at the city, you know, at, through the eyes of a bird, of a bird um, you know, are there going to be places where the canopy doesn't connect? Are there going to be particular um, physical obstacles um, that make it difficult for a bird to travel through a city safely? So I think that is quite exciting. I think we need to be doing more of that kind of work. And Edmonton is is pretty remarkable in, in that way. Um, they they have been a partner city almost from the beginning. And we we were we have been very impressed just with the way they uh, think about uh, um, animals in, in the city and think about the need for uh, for example wildlife passages. I think they have uh, now built something like 35 wildlife passages, which, which basically allow animals to, large and small, to move through their their uh, city, particularly to to kind of address the problem of of the dangers of cars. And so, what's interesting, this is a little bit of an aside. Uh, well, there's the number 35 wildlife passages, and you see on the left, the three images on the left are from 2019. One of the more recent. Uh, wildlife passages that they that they uh, uh, built, and the um, car the the collisions the car wildlife collisions have gone down dramatically. So these are things that actually pay for themselves economically, which is quite 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 interesting. So I've become really interested in how cities can um, you know try to overcome these disconnects and and cars and roads and highways are a big danger and and we understandably think about bigger mammals like uh, mountain lions um, and you probably know a little bit maybe about the story of uh, the mountain lions in in Los Angeles um, this is this is one of the more famous ones p22 and there's the Hollywood Hollywood sign behind that 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 uh, mountain lion. Um, they are doing a number of things. One of the things that got, has gotten the most visibility is this new um, wildlife crossing, quite expensive. They they are claim it's the largest wildlife crossing in the world. I don't know if that's quite true, but it's um, it's going to address not only mountain lions but also, interestingly enough, a lot of discussion about how birds will will benefit. So birds have um, it's not just windows, but they you know they often move across urban landscapes and and roads quite quite low to the ground. If they cross at all, when they do, it 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 puts them in danger of being hit by cars and trucks and so on. So actually, these kinds of wildlife connections. This is a story, by the way, in a re recent story in Audubon magazine about it, but. Uh, so, so we've got to kind of think about this danger for, for birds uh, as well. Um, Los Angeles is doing a lot of interesting things. They have a, a, a new proposed wildlife ordinance that would uh, do a lot of the things on, that you see on the left, uh, creating, ensuring ecological connectivity, protecting trees, providing spaces between buildings, um, wildlife-friendly fencing that lets animals move. Uh, through the landscape, and birds would benefit from from that as well. This is a, a map on the right of ridge lines, and so keeping the ridge lines free as as points of movement are very very important for birds. So um, uh, this is a little bit of a diversion, but I I do think this these things all go together. 
This is, uh, these are images from Singapore, the wonderful story of their smooth coated otters. There are now more than 80 of them that have come back to Singapore, largely because of the restoration of uh, what you see on the left, the, the Kelang River um, and, and, and Bishan Park. Um, anything we can do to, to ecologically, to, to restore the ecology of a city uh, will, will yield benefits like in this case, the return of the of the otters. We have a short film on our webpage about that as well, about about the otters. I'd love for you to watch that. So it's it's been interesting um, to to see how birds would benefit from 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 this kind of ecological restoration. And um, and uh, again, a little bit of a diversion, uh, a little bit of a side sideline. Um, but I've been very uh, intrigued by a lot of work, recent work done by this person, Emily Fairfax, <laughs> and um, around the role of beavers. And um, beavers are returning, uh, being allowed to, allowed to return to many places, um, at least around the U.S., so cities like Denver and Seattle, and even, even uh, Southern California. And her work is showing that where you where you have beavers and you have beaver dams and the way the ways they change the hydrology of of a place that this is really important to as a as an adaptation uh, to wildfires we have we have terrible wildfires now uh, where you have beavers established um, it, they they have this kind of this they serve this this protective function and so one of the clever things she's done is to uh, develop a, she, she got, she told me actually, she's tired of, she got tired of kind of telling, of being asked to, to, to give her um, her three minute elevator speech about what her research is about. So she, she decided to, to um, develop a little, a very low cost animation to show, to show the work, to show what she did. And I thought I would just play this, it's like a minute or just to, so she got all this, she got little felt, um, got felt material and just did this stop motion animation to, to, to show her research. This is kind of cool. So I think I'm, I'm wondering if you're going to be able to see this. Can you see this, Andre? Yeah. Here comes the fire. <laughs> anyway, I'm okay, he says. Uh, the beaver says at the at the end. Uh, so it turns out this is pretty uh, pretty important for uh, for birds uh, as well. Lots of critters. And so I've become very interested in, in that. And, and um, you know, there is a really interesting, here's another little side sideline that, that uh, back in the late 1940s in, uh, in uh, Idaho and also in parts of Northern California, they did this thing of using um, uh, leftover par parachutes from World War II and actually uh, basically parachuting beavers into remote locations uh, with these sort of uh, boxes that would open as as they collapse as they hit the ground, uh, the idea being to partly to relocate beavers that were a nuisance were somewhere, often where where human development was, and yet but but also to to put them into into the natural environment where they can do what they they do so well and and all all these benefits that we're appreciating now. Okay, I'm I've getting close to talking an hour, I'm going to try to go a little faster and maybe uh, I do want to make sure we have time for from some discussion and, and questions. So so what else is going to be uh, part of a, a of a bird friendly city? And so I've just talked a little bit about ecology and uh, as as a part of that, um, trees and urban forests are are going to be uh, uh, really important. There's me standing next to a big tree 
in the Netherlands. And, and so we know there is this, this really important symbiosis between birds and trees. And, and I'm going to say we won't have birds if we don't have trees. Um, and so we've got to think about tree conservation in, in cities. And at least most of the cities that I work with, uh, most of the cities in North America are not doing a very good job conserving or protecting trees. Um, this is a wonderful book, by the way, The Nature of Oaks. Doug Tallamy makes a strong argument for the importance of native species of trees because they provide so much uh, habitat and food uh, for birds, um, like the like our blue jay uh, that you see on the left, and and the blue jay, um, it, it even has a shaped uh, a curve to its beak that has evolved to penetrate the husk of uh, acorns. Acorns that that uh, these are acorns from white oaks, and white oaks provide the most habitat. And it turns out that the the blue jay gets the benefits of of the food from the acorns and, and then the tree benefits because the blue jays, um, they bury these, these acorns for, for, for consumption later. Many of them, they forget where they are and they end up plant, you know, they end up essentially planting little white oak trees and expanding the, the range of this, of this species. So these mutualisms are really quite impressive. So we have a lot of cities, this is Asheville, North Carolina, that have uh, tree conservation, tree protection standards. Most of them are not very good at protecting existing older trees. Um, usually it's a canopy-based system. You, as a developer, you have to reach a certain canopy level. You can do that either by planting new trees or some combination of planting trees and conserving existing trees. And where you can't do either of those, paying a fee into a tree fund that then goes to planting a tree somewhere else. Um, but not very good at protecting the, the existing older trees. Uh, Washington, D.C. has uh, one of the stronger uh, tree protection codes. Uh, so for so-called heritage trees, really large diameter trees, 100, and, 100 inch circumference or greater, uh, which is what, about 30 inches in diameter or something like that. Um, these are protected trees and you are, uh, in theory, not supposed to uh, be allowed to cut them down unless they become hazardous or they're dead, they're, they become a danger to, to, to the public. Um, that's a pretty strong code. I can tell you more about that. Um, so trees have got to be part of it. Um, uh, re returning water to cities is that that beaver example showed daylighting streams that are that are underground in pipes. Um, so example from our partner city, Vittoria Gastez in Spain of bringing back a, a, a small river that was underground in a pipe. Um, an example from Perth in Western Australia of the conversion of a what was a sterile uh, water feature uh, in that city into a biodiverse wetland, native biodiverse wetland in the mi middle of the city, wonderful for dragonflies and, and butterflies and, and birds. So we want, the, we want that, that water as well. Um, everything that we build could be restorative. <laughs> so when we build something, it is a chance to incorporate trees and, and greenery and, and biodiversity like the so-called KTPH hospital uh, in, in Singapore. And the goodness or the, the um, success of this project is in part being evaluated by the numbers of birds seen on, on, the, on site. And, and on one side of one building, they have a running uh, score, a running tally of the birds that they've seen. It's a wonderful way of thinking about the success of a building uh, a project. And, uh, and Singapore, there's a chapter in the book about Singapore and, and quite a bit of discussion about the, the hornbills and the return of these beautiful birds to the city. Uh, it's a, a result of many things. Um, they've, they've and they've kind of pioneered the idea of, a, of, of smart net nesting boxes. And, um, but it's also just bringing more greenery, more trees, more nature into the, into the city. Um, lots of ways that we can be, in addition to trees, we can be incorporating pollinator gardens and, and native plants and flowers that will be very helpful to birds as well. Our partner city, Cora de Bat in Costa Rica, 
has this wonderful program called Sweet City, where they're converting um, sidewalks and spaces between buildings into these beautiful pollinator gardens. Um, similarly, we could be rethinking the spaces around our homes. This is our colleague Nina Marie Lister in Toronto, who, who you see on the left, her native plant uh, yard, that's her house up on the hill there. And she got into trouble because uh, the neighbors didn't like this native landscaping. And, uh, and she became, she was informed that she was in violation of the, of the Toronto tall weeds and grass, tall grass and weeds uh, uh, bylaw. Um, anyway, uh, it should be everyone's right to, to plant your yard in, in species of things that help uh, other critters and birds in particular. She, uh, she managed to get the city, in fact, to change their requirements and make it a make native gardens uh, a, a, a by right thing. Uh, quite, quite an interesting story. So um, there are other threats to, to birds in cities. Um, and we know that domestic and feral cats uh, have a huge impact. Lots of things we could do there. Lots of things cities are doing. Uh, campaigns to, to keep your cats indoors. This this is my cat with a so-called rainbow collar. This is a this is a product that that uh, has been sort of designed and uh, tested to to you know, the bir birds that are, are able to see that collar. Um, that's one approach. Um, another idea that we see in some cities is is a catio, a cat patio, creating a a protected space for your cat outside so that your, your cat can be outside, but birds uh, are safe from your, from your cat. So this is uh, another film we made. There's a, every year something called the Catio Tour, which is a um, kind of like a house tour or a garden tour. So they, they pick 10 catios and you go and you visit the 10, you, you, you move around and, and see different examples of, of catios. So there is a film about that as well. Um, I think we need to celebrate the nature around us and that nature is often birds uh, because they are so uh, wondrous and, and inspiring of awe. They do so many things uh, um, that, that seem remarkable to us. Um, one example in the book is, are the images here uh, in Portland, Oregon, where every uh, spring or every, sorry, every September, every fall, um, hundreds of people converge on this elementary school to watch um, these migrating swifts, these are Vox's swifts. And as the sun goes down, they, they begin to roost in this uh, large chimney. And so on the night that we filmed, there were, the estimate was there were 6,000 swifts uh, in, in the chimney. And they, they, they move in this big, huge swirl. And then as the sun goes down, they kind of, they kind of fall into this, in very dramatic fashion, into this, into this chimney. So I think we need more events like that. We need to be thinking about how, how, how buildings could be not just safer, but we, could we incorporate um, ha positive habitat? Could, I mean, could we, could we uh, not only take away the hazards, but, but rethink buildings and, and urban landscapes so that they, are, they you know, uh, create new habitat? So these are examples from the book. Um, this is a historic building that had a had a, a, a renovated or actually a rebuilt chimney. And that chimney was designed to incorporate 50 something uh, nesting spaces for the Swifts. So I think we, uh, we need to begin to think about how buildings can make room for, for birds. This is an, another example from the UK also in the book. Um, this is a wildlife friendly uh, neighborhood called Kingsbrook where you see the, the openings on the side of this home these are, this is a, a, a kind of swift brick um, a system where the, it just fits into the, into the bricking pattern of that, of that facade. You see them here with my, my little funny uh, circles. So, um, and, and the idea of habitecture, a number of people are exploring this, you know, how does that building facade serve as habitat for, for birds, but also butterflies and other invertebrates and and uh, we've got to kind of rethink uh, buildings as living systems. There are many ways that we could be incorporating birds into the lives of our neighborhoods, whether that's in a dense city 
or in a more suburban environment. This is a story from the book of a community called Aldea, just outside Santa Fe, uh, where, where the citizens have gotten together out of a love for birds. They're uh, installing bird boxes and monitoring birds, and, and they've taken a special interest in the juniper titmouse. There are lots of places and cities where we could actively restore habitat and make room. Uh, these are images from, from Phoenix, Arizona, and the story of burrowing owls there and volunteers coming together to uh, create these underground artificial nesting cavities for, for the, for the burrow, burrowing owls. And they're just right in the middle of, of, of the city. So we have a film about that as well. I'm not going to show you, but uh, we've got to incorporate birds uh, and bird education into schools. Uh, we, we've got to kind of really think about the city in a really new and different way. And um, this is a story from Wellington, New Zealand, wonderful uh, project called Zealandia, where they've built a predator-proof fence around a wild area in the middle of the city, uh, a way to allow the native birds to rebound. The, the, the native bird population in Wellington and, and New Zealand generally uh, has been decimated by the introduction of of uh, animals, non-native animals from other places, uh, weasels and, and rats and domestic cats again. And so the tagline for this, for this program is bringing birdsong back to Wellington. And that's what's happened. So I'm frequently saying um, we need to judge the success of a city by the extent of its birdsong. Um, every city, Every neighborhood in every city should uh, be able to hear native native bird song. This is a wonderful regenerative uh, story. So here is a here is a, um, a newspaper headline from from um, an interview that I did a, a while back. Why we must let bird song be heard in our cities again? I do think it's very uh, important. Um, the last thing I'll say is that there are a lot of things that cities should think about doing or should do beyond their own borders. And partly that is thinking about how they can, one city can work with other cities to create uh, ecological connections and corridors and, and, and conservation of, of forests and habitats beyond the city's boundary. Because of course we know uh, many of the many of the birds that we love in my part of the world uh, spend part of the time, you know, in other places, and many of them are heading down your way. Of course, uh, I mentioned that white-throated sparrow. Um, if I if I love that white-throated uh, sparrow, I've got to think about conserving the boreal forests of Canada. So cities have to begin to kind of work and 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 operate beyond their borders. And so I wonder um, if, if there are opportunities for cities in South America, Central America, South America, to join, gener to join together, maybe even engage in treaty writing, city to city treaties that would um, create the context for working together in a coordinated fashion to conserve the habitat for birds that, that we share or we have, have in, in common. So uh, I'm getting to the end and I, I, well, my last two slides I just flipped through. In the book, um, there's a, a, an interview with this um, Aboriginal elder in Australia, Noel Nana, who, who talks about his upbringing uh, there and how they grew up in a, it's very much a totem, totemic culture where um, each, each young child is, is asked to basically adopt uh, one or more animals, uh, species, and for Noel, it was the bronze wing pigeon. And you learn you learn everything you can about that bird. Uh, he told me so much about that bird that I didn't know. And then you become its its guardian. You you become its um, its advocate, its protector. And uh, so I've, in the book, I talk about how maybe that's a that's a wonderful tradition for us to adopt the non Aboriginal world. Um, that would be a, 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 a wonderful thing that would have a huge impact if we each chose a, a bird. So, um, you know, we, we need to find ways to get out in, into that wondrous bird-friendly environment and uh, uh, to circle back to the COVID 
Uh, I, I think we do have a sense of wonder and curiosity now that, that hopefully we can sustain and birds have been a big part of that. So to end, uh, there are uh, lots of resources uh, out there. Um, uh, so before the Bird Friendly City book, there have been a series of other books that had to do with biophilic cities, including one by the title Biophilic Cities. Uh, there are full length um, films like a film called The Nature Cities. Um, and it's a, just another example of one of the books, the Handbook of Biophilic City Planning and Design has been recently translated into Chinese. Um, there are the films I mentioned. Uh, there are uh, There is an online journal called Biophilic Cities that, by the way, has a lot of stories about birds. Um, that ends up being a lot, a lot of what I end up, excuse me, writing about and being inspired uh, by. And in fact, this was the most recent, has been the most, we're working on, working on a new issue now that hasn't been published, but the last one was May uh, 2022. And there is um, a feature story about the burrowing owls of uh, Marco Island in, uh, in Florida and a really interesting conservation strategy actually for uh, uh, paying uh, residents to, to basically um, accommodate or, or al allow a burrowing owl um, a family to occupy a burrow in on their yard in their yard, which is kind of interesting. So, so that that's it. Do take a look at the Biophilic Cities Network, biophiliccities.org, and there is, by the way, a bird friendly city um, page um, there with um, stories and 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 um, resources. And for example. Uh, a, um, a a resource guide to to bird safe windows and bird safe uh, products that might might be really interesting to to look at. So that's that's it. I'll stop and may, hopefully we'll have a little time for if I haven't used up so much time. I, I think I have, but I'm going to stop sharing, and um, I'm hoping you're all still there. Of course we are. Preguntas, chicos, dudas. Questions? Do you have uh, bird bird stories? I, I'd love to hear them. Or of course, examples. we have a lot of bird stories. I'm sure. Uh, Adriana Young, primero, después Dana. Hello, nice to meet you, and Hi. thank you for the very interesting uh, exposition. I would like to make a question uh, related to airports. Airports, because, okay. yeah. Yeah, in, in the case of airports, these are the biggest areas of our cities. Mm. And uh, my question is, how can we meet the search for biodiversity and at the same time, the need for bird control? Because yeah. uh, most of the, of the green areas that you can put attract birds, yeah. even if it's a small loans, no? So yeah. <laughs> so this is my question for you okay. and thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, um, I, and I'm certainly no ex expert on this. Um, however, I, I have been, a, a, one, one of the, I think one of the reasons I really uh, connect with birds um, is that I, I started flying at a really early age. Um, I, I did a lot of um, general aviation. I got my pilot's license when I was 17 and was very, and I did a lot of um, uh, gliding, a lot of sailplaning. And, and we, and we watched the, uh, the birds, particularly the, the vultures, the, the turkey vultures and, and black vultures. We would, we would look for the thermals by, by seeing where they were. And we would try to go there and fly fly there. Um, so as a as a pilot, I mean, you're, you 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 certainly the dramatic examples, you know, like the the jet that that hit the the flock um, of birds that ended up the one that landed on the Hudson River in in New York. Uh, and and there certainly are dangers, um, and um, and so we have to be careful about about that. And airports do all kinds of things to to try to scare away birds. Um, some of them have been very clever, right? At at they're even they're even at airports. I think Amsterdam maybe has used uh, birds of prey as a way of of scaring away you know a lot of other birds. 
so I, I think there I think there are coexistent strategies there that that are that are working to some degree. Um, yeah, so I would say that, and then I would say that I mean this, the the dangers of bird aircraft strikes once you're at, once you're beyond the landing the landing and takeoff, the approach and you know departure um, is is probably not a is not a, a, a you know terrible terribly high risk of of thing of, of things going going badly. So I I would hate to overreact and and um. But yeah, I, I think there are lots of, you know, potential conflicts between um, birds and, and lots of other things. And, and I mentioned a few of them, including cars and trucks, for example. But yeah, that's a good question. Okay, next one, Dana. Uh, sí. um, good evening. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for everything that you just said. It was really life changing since I uh, now used to hate birds. Well, not birds, mm -hmm. pigeons. Oh, and yeah, because I had a lot of bad experiences with them, and okay. now with everything you shared, I it had it has really given me a new look to it. So, yeah, okay. thank, you. thank you for it. and. As for the question, um, I don't know how you, how informed are you with our situation right now with birds. There are a lot of birds in Peru, well, pigeons specifically. Even mm. in our bus, there are a lot of birds. Um, mm. and I would like to see your point of view of the future with building for birds is concerned to our country. Yeah, I want to know more about uh, Peru and, and, and <laughs> birds in Peru. I don't know that I don't know very much. Um, we've just been, um, you know, it's interesting. We we did a, a project for the uh, or participated in a in a World Bank um, uh, set of a, a kind of set of meetings with with cities from Latin American countries. And I, I heard a lot about birds. Uh, several uh, cities uh, from Colombia, for example, where where uh, I think Medellin was one of them. You know, where where they're uh, they've been planting trees in the city, and they're they're seeing a lot of birds come back. And um, um, I, I'm, I I presume you have a lot of biodiversity in the form of birds. Uh, certainly, certainly the Amazonian parts of your country, right, would uh, uh, hugely important in that in that way. So, um, and and, and I, I think there's just a huge potential um, for things like ecotourism, for example. I mean, there's just a these are really important drivers of of economies, or they can be, and um, and so. Um, I think we need to appreciate the the re remarkable bird diversity that that you that you have. I, I want to know more about it, and I want to I want to I'd love to spend some time looking for and watching birds in in, in Peru. Where 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 is where are the best places? Can you you mentioned uh, pigeons a few times, but are, are, do you see um, Beautiful birds. Uh, I mean, do you see diversity of bird species in 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 Lima, for example? By the way, I know one of the stories in the book is is about the about turkey vultures um, and that very interesting program for um, radio collaring and and um, putting putting little little um, camera helmets on 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 a number of I think they were turkey vultures. Maybe they were black vultures, actually. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so um, the center, La Plaza de Armas, like the center mm -hmm. of, the, of the town of our city, it's known yeah. for Italians, but I, yeah, I'm kind of a new ignorant in that aspect because I, I don't know much about birds in general, just pigeons, because there are a lot, <laughs> lot okay. in your But yeah. Pigeons um, are great, yeah. Yeah, and I also, Wanted to share that um, you talked about and 
your experience with birds and how it reminded you to your childhood. Yeah. And I hadn't thought, thought about it, but um, when you mentioned it, I automatically just a thought pop into my head. And it's really um, mind changing because at least for me, um, the presence of pigeons or birds in general mm -hmm. are like a remind I remind to you that um, there's there's not just humans in the world or in the place you are at. Yeah. There are a lot of stray animals, dogs specifically, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, uh, other species, other life species just changes you. And that's how, how I looked at that perspective. Yeah. How, yeah important is to build for, for animals in general and how that connects yeah. to vegetation, to green areas. Yeah. And that change, life changing for me. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, we we want to be, we, we want things around us, right? We want to have, we want to be in cities where there's, there are lots of different kinds of life and, and, and uh, you mentioned several different kinds of animals. Um, the thing about birds is that they they are often the backdrop. You know, they're all around us, and they're floating. They're they're floating. They're flying. They're they're you know they're they're living in a three three D city. You know, where it, it I've been talking about immersive nature. And so it's um that, that's where you actually can feel immersed in this feeling of being immersed when you have birds above you and around you, and the sound is coming. It's beautiful, and you're you know it's a um, uh, there are very few other forms of life that that uh, co-occupy co urban spaces to in the same way, you know. So, I, I, for me, it's they're in a special category. But, but do you? Who has a favorite bird? Do you have any favorite birds? Favorite species of birds, or a favorite song? Favorite sound? A bird bird song or bird sound? Bird bird. bird I call? have actually. Okay. I like I said, I'm kind of an ignorant about it, and I don't know the name of it, but it's super common in Peru. Um, it's actually, I heard it today, and oh. it reminded me of my childhood. Oh, okay. Um, it's in the campus. It's a really common sound. Um, I totally for, forgot about the name, but it's it's everywhere. It, I yeah. don't know, it feels, the sound it makes, it, it's comfortable. Okay. Great. Yeah, and thank you. Like sure. to all my participation, you're really passionate about this topic and it's really interesting. Thank you for what you just shared. Sure, thank you. Um, Andre, I don't know how much time we have, but what other, yeah, what other birds or other <laughs> stories or mem memories of birds? I mean, it's, I, I find that birds and the sound of birds um, that, you know, it, it's sort of, it, we have a lot of um, personal and familial, you know, baggage that that um, connects with that baggage. Yeah, we can try out some stories, some like I can find something for you, and uh, about the birds and birds stories here from Peru and from Brazil, if you want, because I'm from Brazil. Yeah, Brazil, lots of birds there too. There, yes. yeah, <laughs> and uh, it could be great. Um kind again about the green infrastructure and uh, you talk in earlier in your presentation. I, I'm really curious about um in the, the beginning of your um, biophilic cities network, no? Mm -hmm. Uh well here here in Latin America we have a, a very insufficient uh, budget on green infrastructure by city governments, no? Uh, do you see the same thing in the maybe in the in the cities in in your network at the beginning? I don't know mm. how how they they start to to progress in this area. Maybe with the uh, engagement. I don't know. What's your thoughts about it? Yeah. Um, well, there uh, cities have have different, obviously different stories and different histories and in different contexts but um I, I think it is true 
that um, that many many of our cities in our network are 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 getting getting better traction. You know the the language of nature based nature based solutions to this nature based solution. And, and the green infrastructure, it's a kind of an extension of the ecological infrastructure, green infrastructure, that, that there is a growing recognition, I think, that, that it's often more cost effective to, to invest in trees and, and wetlands and nature, you know, as a way of responding to, especially climate change. And um, I, I, so many of our cities now are having to deal with urban heat in a way that they didn't before maybe, or, you know, it's, and we're looking at the projections into the future. And so it isn't, it isn't optional anymore. It, it's, it's absolutely, these are absolutely essential investments. Um, we're still not doing enough, even, even in some of the richest cities, right? There's still not enough resources for tree protection, for example, tree, tree planting. And, um, so, so we see this evolution, and and uh, climate change has helped to move it, helped to move along, helped to give more more priority to to to, to nature and trees and greenery, and um, uh, but you're yeah you're right. I mean that finding the resources, it it's particularly now in 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 cities that are experiencing maybe crime rates or um, you know they're they're there are things kind of counter counter poles, things that that um, that may, may be more um, where there's more political support or or um, you know more more uh, kind of demand for for action. The crime crime rates, for, for example. Why should we spend more money on on trees and biodiversity and nature when when we what we what we need are more police or more whatever I don't know I, I think those are false um, false choices in some ways right I mean we we know that some of the some of the most important things we could do to create um, a city where we treat each other better and you know is, is to is to like the evidence I cited in the beginning of the presentation about we are we're better human beings when we have nature and yeah. and um, uh, so I think I think we 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 should and we are thinking about nature more holistically and understanding that it's it's about uh, air quality and you know natural hazard reduction and and uh, quality of life and all, all these things are are being helped along by it's not just a um, a parks department budget that's that yeah. that that has to compete with something else it's really addressing a whole range of of urban of urban issues and, and we need and we need nature every day this is the, the best yeah we thing. need it every day every hour really yeah right we have one last question here from isela part of forming sustainable cities is having green space how can urban ag agriculture uh, fit ah. into this idea of okay. Ur urban design? agriculture yeah um that's a great Great question. I don't think that I really talk about it in the book much, but um, you know, many of the we have a number of examples of cities that have been uh, planting not just uh, trees like white oaks, but but edible fruit fruit trees, and um, and sometimes there's a little competition between the birds and hu humans who want to harvest <laughs> that that fruit. But there there are a lot of um, there are a lot of ways we could be planting edible things that could be shared, right? It's partly about harvesting for us, but it's also uh, creating food for uh, for birds. Um, and I I think that that that's one one possible way. Other, uh, you know, urban agriculture more generally. If we if we maybe put the birds aside for a second. Um, huge, huge potential, right? We 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 really we want to recognize that cities are cities can and should be bountiful. They can be places where we produce a lot of food um, that can happen on rooftops and and balconies and backyards and um, and cities can be places where food food is 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 processed and prepared and you know where we can profoundly reduce our 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 food footprints and we can. You know, bring bring all that 
uh, reduce those food miles, make it you know part of the the cir circular city that we you know we know we need to to, to imagine. Um, so so you know urban ag is is, is really really important um, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, in terms of of birds, I mean the other I guess the other interesting thing that comes to mind is is thinking about um, I don't know if you have a bird friendly coffee, for example. Um, mm -hmm. There, no. Well, there there are, there are several organizations. The Audubon Society um, ha, um, sells bird friendly coffee. There, there are a number of examples of. Um, we have a cat friendly coffee. <laughs> you have a cat friendly coffee? <laughs> yeah, yeah, in Cusco. Oh, okay. Yeah, but bird friendly, I, I, I didn't know. Yeah, well, well, basically the idea that you could you could produce uh, coffee in a in a way um, that doesn't destroy, you know, habitat. Um, that you know, the idea of of kind of um, uh, ha habitat shared with 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 coffee, you know, coffee plants, coffee trees, um, the, the just kind of rethinking agriculture so mm -hmm. that it's it's not just this this industrial row by row of of something uh heavily drenched in in herbicides and fertilizer and so on but but ra rather you know you you have this sort of more mixed landscape where whether it's cocoa or co you know or or coffee or um e even examples like i i guess of of um uh you know um other kind other kinds of 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 uh products other kinds of agricultural goods that that are that are produced in quantity but that don't don't deforest that don't you know that um so i think that's that's really interesting i don't know how that could happen so much in a city but but uh um, but there's a lot of um lots of bird friendly uh, agricultural products now that are that are trying to to push that that along, um, and I, I think that's promising um, as well. I don't know what did you have in mind. What ideas did you have? Whoever asked that question, I, I guess there could be some conflicts, right? Sometimes uh, far farmers don't always like birds because uh, they do eat seeds, and they do you know there there is some some competition. Um, there uh so but I, I i'd like to imagine a world where where we we plant enough and we have enough fruit and apples and whatever to to you know feed everybody birds included okay we have our last question Tim. okay uh, what about sickness coming from birds lima we have a le a le at least that idea about pigeons that they transport disease yeah yeah, I don't have a very good answer for that. Um, I, I don't. I don't. I'm not suggesting that uh, that you necessarily have birds as pets, or that you. Um, um, you know, our experience of birds, we we want we want to watch them and and listen to them. Uh, we don't necessarily want to be handling them, or you know. So I I think that that that's better for the birds, and better better for us. Um, so, um, I think, I think that it's possible to, to have, be, be completely safe. I mean, we, we don't know here, here we are in the sort of pandemic. We're not, we're, you know, we're all worried about what the next virus or sub sub variant will, will be right. And, and, um, bird flu and all, you know, all these, these longstanding concerns about, uh, close proximity with, with all kinds of animals, not just birds, of course. So we have to be careful and safe and, and all of that, um, but uh, there's, there's no reason why we can't have um, birds all around us, um, but we should not be handling them and we should not be, you know, for, for their own good. You know, they, they have a life and a, habit, a, a, a habitat and, and it, we, we co-share that space, but, but, it, but, it, but part of that coexistence is respecting their space and giving them spaces and creating, you know, uh, we, we watch them and enjoy them with some distance. Yeah. 
is that is that we need to do some more research about this no yeah i, I don't know much about it. it's a really good question I, I don't have a very good answer otherwise yeah okay so again tim is very touching to hear you every time talk about biophilic cities urban nature and now bird friendly city no, I hope we can see each other physically. Yeah. Maybe. No, so you here, if you all want some of these, this is the book. So I'm happy to I send you some, you know, uh, let me know. I, I'll put something in the mail or you can find it. You said on Amazon, I guess. But. OK, I, I and think we should do. I'd University love to do uh, birds of birds of Lima. Let's uh, let's do something um, that could understand uh, the role of birds in making in Lima a biophilic city. Yeah, um, yeah. Birds are a point of entree. You know, they're really a, you know, a, a, a way to, to reach people's hearts about it. Let's do something together. Maybe we can start yeah. a, a little research about this. That'd and, be great. No, this could be a, a little good start. Yes, or I like that idea. Our network, maybe Lima yeah. and other cities could be also a great part of of this change right yeah thank you again Tim, uh, for your you participation all. and see you next time okay take care everybody thank you gracias chicos nos right. vemos mañana continuando la semana bye 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 bye